Well hello. This week we're going to do something a little bit different and new. Um, I think I, next week I want to do something to, to, to talk about the rapture. But before we do that, I want to go into detail about Daniel chapter 9 verse 27. Because that's the, the uh, a big division in Christianity over this doctrine. And um, I just want to explore it a little bit. And we're going to look right into the Hebrew language and decipher what this verse actually says. Because it's quite um, a mystery. It's, 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 a little, it's a difficult verse to translate. And just to get the idea out of it, of what it really says. And what it, and what it possibly means. So, let's get into it. Before we do, uh, don't forget to, take a, to hit the like button. Smash the like button. And subscribe and share. Thank you. The two most important verses in the Bible about the, the uh, prophecy concerning the coming Messiah. And those two verses are Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 and 27. Now I did do a video already on the entire ninth chapter of Daniel. If you'd like to see it, I'll put a link to it up here. Um, but for now, after we've covered that already, I want to focus more on Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 and 27. Now the problem we have in this day and age is that um, English translations aren't really accurate enough to understand these verses. It's pretty deep Hebrew. So we're going, we're going to get into the Hebrew and translate those two verses word by word so you can see how it works and how the King James, even the King James is a, quite an accurate translation but even in some places like this it, it just doesn't meet the mark. So let's start um, with Daniel chapter 9 26 okay so we got there's the here's the uh, the verse in the King James Version and after three score and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off but not for himself and the people of the pr prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the error of and the end thereof shall be with a flood and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. So that's not too hard to understand right there. Is um, after three score and two weeks. Now in my other video I already showed how that, that how you can calculate that uh, 69 weeks into the coming of Jesus. In, uh, the, into the date of the coming of Jesus. And, and it was after the 69 weeks, he will be cut off. That means uh, cut off from the living of this life on earth. Uh, this, this would mean his death. But not for himself, because he did it for us, right? And the prince... And the people of a prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And that is the sanctuary. The sanctuary is the temple, the holy temple of God. The city is Jerusalem. That, that's like, this is a Jewish document. There's no doubt that that's what it means. So he will come and destroy Jerusalem and the temple. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. Okay? So let's, let's just look at the end shall be with a flood. So here we go. The, the city... 
Vahair, the city, Vehakodesh, the city and the holy. Okay, this is a noun, okay? And Vaha, that's and the Kodesh. And this is a noun. And what does ho, uh, um, the noun mean? Kodesh means holy. It can be translated in several ways. Okay, as a noun, it means uh, holiness or sacredness. And or, or if it's mikdash, that's the sanctuary, the sacred place. And as a verb, it means he was clean, as opposed to unclean. And as a pl verb, which is a strong verb, kidash, he consecrated something. He set something apart as sacred or holy. And as a hitpayel verb, which is a reflexive in this case, he purified himself or he consecrated himself. So this is the, the uh, word kodesh, which is used in several uh, di different ways. And in this particular way, it's used as a noun. And what it would mean would be, it doesn't really mean sanctuary. It would mean, and the holiness. So he just shall destroy the city and the holiness. And I guess it sounds kind of confusion, confusing why they say that. And so they said, well, it must mean the sanctuary. But the sanctuary, it would have said, Mikdash. That's the actual name of the sanctuary. That, that's the word that is used in the Bible often as the sanctuary, Mikdash. This is Hakodesh, which is the holiness. So he will destroy the city and the holiness. Shachat, he shall destroy, right? Yishachat. And the people, the people of the prince that shall come, and the end, Ketz is end, and the end of him or it shall be with a flood. Shetef. So let's look at this word flood, shatef. Okay, we want to dig in a little bit here. So we click on the Strong's number there, shatef. Okay, shatef, outflowing of waters, flood, or outrageous. Now, what we can do very easily now is scroll all the way down and it shows you verses where this word, this same Hebrew word is being used. Who has divided a water course for the overflowing of waters? Or a way for lighting, lightning of thunder? Well, that's poetry, so that's a little bit different. Okay, Psalm is also pro poetry. Daniel, so here's Daniel, okay. Um, an Nahum, but with an overrunning flood, he will make an under an utter end of the place, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. With the arms of a flood, thereof the sanctuary then shall be with a flood. Wrath is cruel, and anger is outrageous. So it's used as a flood or outrageous. For this shall every one that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou may be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. So it can be used as a flood or outrageous. How does this work? Shataf. 
effusion, outpouring of rain, of a torrent, or the metaphor, an outpouring like a torrent of anger, an outpouring, a torrent is like a rapid torrent is anger, inundation, a flood. His end comes as a flood, meaning suddenly. Now this is Jacenius. He's a. This was a German uh, scholar that lived about a hundred years ago or so. Um, very uh, well known. Yeah, this here is Jacenius Hebrew grammar. This is the reference standard. Very thin pages. It's a five hundred, six hundred pages. Uh, this is the reference standard for Hebrew grammar, Biblical Hebrew, understanding uh, how the sentences are and what the words mean and what different types of words and how sentences are put together. So, and then uh, also, this book here is, is, is a reference standard for studying Hebrew. This is a uh, Brown Driver Briggs. Hebrew English lexicon for looking up the English meaning of Hebrew words. The Strong's Concordance is a little bit different because they don't give you, they don't study the, the meaning of the word and list it for you. All they do is they tell you what words it was translated into. Like if you get a Strong's Concordance based on the King James Bible, They'll tell you what words it was translated into, and that's it. So what, no matter what it actually means. So you, you, sometimes you can have a list of 25 words that one word was translated into. And it's just telling you what the King James translators translated that word into. So sometimes it can be a little bit misleading. It, when you look at the original Hebrew, you can see, um, like outrageous, it's, it's out, actually it means an outpouring of anger, it, it means wrath, it means, um, um, you know, a burst of anger. It, it's so outrageous that maybe in 1611 it meant that, it doesn't necessarily mean that now. So there's, there's a lot of problems you run into even over the English language. But um, I found that if you get an old dictionary, if you, if you like to use the King James Version, get yourself an older dictionary because you want to know what those words meant before they started mangling the language. Okay, this is my uh, dictionary that I like to use when I'm uh, reading the King James Bible. King's English Dictionary. I found it in a, in a thrift store, and I've seen them others before, so you can find them out there. It's about from the early 1930s. See, they're telling you about the modern technology. Wireless telegraphy and telephony. You know what they're talking about? Radios. The newest thing, radios. There's some great pictures in here too. Latest developments in motor transport. That's how old this thing is. It's crazy, eh? Here's, a, here's some more latest developments. You gotta see the aircraft. I gotta show you the aircraft. Latest types of aeroplanes. <laughs> it's kind of a fun dictionary to have. Now, let's look up why would the King James translate that word as outrageous? Well, we look it up in here. King's English Dictionary, outrageous, violent, 
furious, atrocious, exorbitant. So outrage. That's what it means. It means violent outrage. So now they, you know, if they're on a carnival ride, they'll say this is outrageous. So it, the languages do develop over time. So you have to be careful with the King James when you're reading um, to assume that it has a modern meaning to the English word. It's not always the case. There's a lot of words that have older meanings, and that is the meaning the King James meant. So let's, uh, we don't have to look it up in here because it's right here. Brown Driver Briggs. Okay, it says, uh, Noun, masculine, means a flood, a figurative of judgment, um, calamity, flood of anger. So I don't know like where they get outrageous overflowing, but it's, it's more these is, uh, these Brown Driver Briggs or Jesenius are more authoritative on what the word actually means. Um, and it's more of a flood and, or an outpouring of anger or judgment. Okay? A like the Noah's Ark was a flood of judgment. It's an outpouring of anger. So that's sort of what, what, it, what it's rooted in. So the end thereof will be with a flood. So Jesus said the, the end shall be just like Noah's, the flood of Noah's ark. People will be eating and drinking, and it shall come suddenly, like a flood, right? So the end shall be like a flood, and unto the end of the war, desolations. So the end of the war, with a flood, and unto the end, oh yeah, milhama. That's a that's a battle or a war. The end of the battle, right? Or or many battles are determined. Desolations, okay? Un, unto the end of the war. Well, what war is he talking about? So. Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Not for himself. It's for us. And the people of a prince that shall come shall destroy Jerusalem and the temple. Okay? And the holiness. The, what does the holiness mean in the temple? It's like you are unclean or you are clean. You, the only way that you could get clean is in the temple. And so the temple is the only place of holiness. It was called the most holy place, the place where God dwells. That was how the, the Jews viewed it. It's how they still view it. It's, it's uh, the only place that you could possibly be cleansed from sin. It's the only place you can become pure. So... That's what it means, the end of the city, Jerusalem, and the holiness. It's like, you can't get holy without the temple. So it's the end of holiness, okay? And the end shall be with a flood, or like a flood, okay? And unto the end of the war, now this is the war between the Messiah, who's cut off, and the people who cut him off, and killed, killed him, and destroyed the city. So who is that? That's the Romans and the Jews, right? Or you, I wouldn't necessarily de, um, interpret it as the Jews, but maybe more the religious zealots. If you read uh, Joseph Josephus on how the temple was destroyed, the Roman general didn't want to destroy it. It was one of the seven wonders of the world. He wanted to keep it and, 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 uh, 
and just so you know bring the Jews under submission but these zealots these 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 war warrior zealots refused to deal and wanted it all or nothing and it was because of them the Romans ended up having to destroy it. It was almost an accident. The temple caught fire because they made a fortress out of it and that was their final keep. So it was kind of a, a extremism and um, the Romans not willing to give up. Well, he couldn't give up because he was under orders. So, you know, that's sort of how it went. So it's the zealous religious zealots and the Romans who destroyed the temple and the city of Jerusalem. So the wars between the Messiah and the people who killed him, not only killed him, but also destroyed the city and the sanctuary. It, it was a combination of the same thing. The religious zealots handed Jesus over to the Romans. Okay, so that's what this is talking about. And desolations are determined. So this is important to know too, desolations. What's this word? Shamet. So we'll take a look again, Strong's. Click on that, and it brings us over here to be desolate. These are the different verbal forms, okay? Actually, what form are we looking at? It's just a, a cow participle. Okay? So it's a participle. Simple participle. To be appalled. Or awestruck. So how is this word used? We'll get a good idea of how this is... Um, in Leviticus, I will send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children and destroy your cattle and make you f few in number, and your highways shall be desolate. So instead of full, full of people, they'll be empty, and there will be fear, and there will be problems, right? And I will make your cities waste and bring your sanctuaries into desolation, and I will not smell the savor of your sweet odors. So there you are. And I will bring the land into desolation, and your enemies which dwell therein shall be astonished at it. Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbath as long as it lies desolate. So a wasteland, empty. As long as it is desolated. So what's desolated here in Daniel chapter 9? It's de desolated is, is um, to be made empty, basically, waste, be made a waste, and to be, in, and emotionally, to be appalled, to be in shock, awestruck at how bad it is. Okay? So, desolations are determined. In this war between this Rome and this Christ, there's going to be desolations. There's going to, people are going to be awestruck. They're going to be in shock at this war. Okay? And unto the end. So from the time Christ died, unto the end, there's going to be this war. And the people are going to be awestruck. And there's going to be desolations of desolations of the, the path to holiness and people finding the truth. Okay? That's sort of what it's talking about in my mind. So now the next verse, this is where we're going to get into it a little bit deeper. That's just sort of set it up. This is the important one to really dig into. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Okay? So here it is, and he shall confirm. Berit a, a covenant, not the covenant, a covenant. 
if it was the covenant, it would have a, a, a hey, the letter hey in front of it. It would be habarit. If it, but it, but it's not the covenant. It's a covenant. Okay, and he shall confirm. So what's that? Let's take a look. Just at how this is used. Okay. And the waters prevailed, and were increased. Prevailed. The primary power is that of binding to prevail, to be strong, to bind up anything broken. So this is a binding, as in binding and loosening, okay? Um, primitive root, to be strong, to prevail, to act in, to insolently, to exceed. So how is it being used? The waters prevailed in the flood over the earth. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth. Fix fifteen cubits did the waters prevail. And the waters prevailed. So it goes over and over. Okay, let's scroll down out of the flood a little bit. And they bend their tongues like a bow for lies, but they are not valiant for the truth. So they do not prevail for the truth. They're not strong for the truth. For these things I weep, my eye, my eye runs down with water, because the comforter that should relieve my soul is far from me. My children are desolate because the enemy prevailed. That's in Lamentations. So we get a good idea how this word works. And here's Daniel here. He shall confirm or be strong in the covenant with many. Okay? So let's go back to Daniel. Okay, so, so he shall, this is talking about the Messiah, right? After three, this is a typical way that Hebrew works, is they give you the big story and then they dig in a little bit. So he's saying, after three score or two weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. So, and now he's going back, talking about the Messiah. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. This is his fi the final week, right? He shall be strong in the covenant with many. What covenant? The new covenant. The covenant of the gospel of Jesus. I will put my law into their minds and into their hearts. I will remember their sins no more. That's the new covenant. So he shall... Be strong in the covenant with many. What's many? Many means um, too many, right? This is le rav. Berit? Le ravim. Okay, rav means many. Much, many. Ravim is... This is like a, a this is a, a an adjective that's being kind of used as a noun. It's a plural, so the many, to the la la ravim to the many. So he will be strong in the covenant to the many or with the many for one week. Well, who's the many? It's not not just one but many. So that's like the Jews and the Gentiles, with many, right? That's the covenant, okay? For one week. For a week? Ahad, one, one week, okay? Vahatsi. And in the midst, in the middle, okay, of the week, ha shavua. The, in the middle of the week, he shall cause to cease. Okay, this is a hifil, hifil verb, which is a causative. He shall cause this. Shavat. Okay, what's Shavat? The seventh. That's the Sabbath. Shavat. 
Shabbat is a Sabbath, but Shabbat is he will cause to end. So the Shabbat, Shabbat as a noun is Sabbath, Shabbat. Shevet as a simple verb is um, he rested, Shevet. But Shabit, Shabit, that's he caused to rest or he brought to an end. Okay? So he will bring it to an end. And in the midst of the week, he shall bring to an end or cause to rest the sacrifice, Zaba. That's, uh, that's um, the ritual sacrifice. And Mincha. Uh, the oblation. That's like the drink offering. We can look at this. Gift. Offering. Present. Oblation. Meat offering. Gift. Present. Tribute. Okay. Grain offering. So these are the side offerings aside from the sacrificial main offering, right? So it's basically saying the sacrifice and the offering is meaning he will bring to an end the service in the temple, basically, is what it, what it means, okay? He will cause sacrifice and oblation to cease. And here's where it gets a little interesting. So let's write that down first. We'll write down sort of um, um, an accurate translation of this. Okay, so he shall be strong in the covenant or confirm a covenant with the many for one week and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to end. Now that doesn't it could be ending forever, or it could be ending for a fixed period of time. It, it, it could be either. It just doesn't say which. And now, this is uh, kind of going into another sentence now. And upon the wing. Okay. Now, what's upon the wing? This is where it gets, where we have to dig in. Upon, ve'al, and upon, kanav. Now, the King James translate this as overspreading. The overspreading of abominations. But that's not really accurate. Because if you look at the word wing, like, it makes sense that a wing as a, uh, a con another concept, as a, as a, uh, maybe a feeling or, or a concept of a symbolic concept that it would represent a spreading out, but it doesn't actually represent that. Let's take a look. Kanaf. How is this? This is a wing or the extremity, the edge, the winged border of a garment, the like a priest's robe has a decorated edge, that is the wing. Or a priest with his robes, hit the edges of his robes are like the wings of the robe. That's what it means, the extremity. So here's how it, here's how it used, okay? And God created the whales and every winged fowl, so it's used as a wing, right? Every bird of every sort so it's a bird is a winged creature right these eagles wings okay the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings and the mercy seat with the wings it's describing the ark of the covenant okay the cherubims and their wings uh right the Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward shall be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. Now this concept 
is like the Lord is holding you in his arms. Okay, the, but he's using the word wings as like the wings of a bird. So it still means wings in this sentence. Under whose wings you are come to trust. Okay, so the word itself means wings. Cursed is he that lies with his father's wife because he uncovered his father's skirt. And all the people shall say amen. So here it means skirt. Okay. But it sort of still means he uncovered the edge of his father's garment. Okay. Because we'll see this in other, uh, in other verses. See here. And David, when he was uh, being chased by Saul, Behold the day of which the Lord said to thee, Behold, I will deliver thy enemy into thy hand, that thou may do to him as it shall seem good to thee. And David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privately. So he cut off the edge of his robe. Okay, And it came to pass af afterward that David's heart smote him, because he had cut off Saul's edge of his robe. Okay? See, the skirt of your robe is in my hand, right? It's, it's translated as skirt, but it's really the edge. So here it is. Speak to the children of Israel and bid them that they make them fringes on the borders of their garments. So that's the wings, the fringes on the borders of their garments through their generations and that they put on the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue. So there's the the borders of the garments, okay? Thou shalt make the fringes on the four quarters of thy vesture. So it's not the quarters, it's actually the borders, all around the borders of your vesture that you cover yourself with, okay? A man shall not take his father's wife or discover his father's skirt or, or come under the borders of his father's garment. You understand? It's a, un, not even under the edge of his garment is what it means. Okay? So if we look at Ruth now, okay, Ruth and uh, Boaz, okay? So uh, Boaz says to, to Ruth, The Lord recompense your work, and a full reward be given you of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you are come to trust. So under, in this sentence, it means wings. And he said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your handmaid. This is where she laid down beside him. Right? And she said, Spread therefore your skirt over your handmaid. Um, what she meant is the border of his garment over her that uh, would um, symbolize that he would take her for his wife. Okay? And as Samuel turned about to go away, he laid hold upon the border of his mantle, and it ripped. That was uh, Saul, right? So that's what it means. It means the border of the garment, not the skirt, or not the corner. Um, is any border of the garment. Or a wing. So now let's get back to Daniel. And he shall con and and for the and upon. See, it says and for the overspreading of abominations. No, it doesn't say that. It says and upon the wing or the border. Okay. Kanaf, kanaf, the wing or the border. In this, it is a noun. 
a construct. So a wing of this, abominations. On the border of abominations or on the wing of abominations? Well, let's take a look. What are abominations? Okay. Now, this is a, quite a complicated word here. Shikutsim. Shikutsim. Okay. And it's based on the word shikuts, which means abomination. And the im would be make it a plural. So abominations. Okay. So it's a noun, abominations. What does it mean? A detestable thing or an idol, an abominable thing. Well, that's kind of vague, isn't it? Let's take a look at the verses. Okay. And you have seen their abominations and their idols, wood and stone, silver and gold, which were among them. Abominations. Okay. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. Okay? An idol. And then did Solomon build a high place for Shemosh, the abomination of Moab, and the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. So it's sort of um, an idol or a false god, or the idol that represents the false god. Okay, The high places that were before Jerusalem, which were on the right hand of the Mount of Corruption, which Solomon, the king of Israel, built for Ashtaroth, the abomination of the Zidonians. Okay. And when Asa heard these words then, and the prophecy of Oded, the prophet, he took courage and put away the abominable idols out of all the land of Judah and Benjamin. Okay? Abominations. He that kills, this is the last, verse, last chapter of Isaiah, he that kills an ox as if he slew a man and says, yeah, they have chosen their own ways and their soul delights in their abominations. That's their false gods and their idols, right? If thou wilt return, O Israel, says the Lord, return to me. And if thou wilt put away your abominations out of my sight, then shall thou not remove. You, shall, you will not be sent into exile, right? For the children of Judah have done evil in my sight, says the Lord. They have set their abominations in the house which is called by my name to pollute it, to make it unholy, unclean. They put their idols in God's house. Okay? I have seen thy adulteries and neighings and lewdness and whoredom and your abominations on the hills, in the fields, idols okay and they have filled my inheritance with the carcass of their detestable and abominable things abominations okay they set their abominations in the house which is called by my name to defile it with all thy detestable things so with all you have defiled my sanctuary with all your abominations. Okay? Abominations. Okay? Uh, but as for them whose heart walks after the heart of their abominations, and their abominations I will recompense their way upon their own heads. Cast ye away every man the abominations of his eyes, and defile not yourselves with the idols of Egypt. You see? Cast away the abominations of their eyes, neither did they forsake the idols of Egypt. And commit you whoredom after their 
abominations, their false gods and their idols, right? So that's basically what it's talking about. So what's he saying? Okay, so, and upon the wing of abominations or upon the edge of abominations or the extremity of abominations. I'd say upon the edge or the extremity. I'd say upon the edge of abominations. He shall make it desolate. Okay, what's this mean? This is an active participle in the Puel, and it is Shamem. Okay, what does Shamem mean? To be desolate. In the Puel, to be stunned, appalling, causing horror. Participle in the Puel. Appalling or causing horror. That's what it means. Okay? Strongs. Desolate. Appalled. Astonished. Okay? So it, it's in the poo well, and it's a participle. So it says here it's going to be appalling or causing horror. Okay? So the and and upon the wing or upon the edge of a abominations he shall upon the edge of abominations let's write this down so okay first kings 9 8 at this house which is high everyone that passes by it shall be astonished okay but the land of the Lord was heavy upon them of Ashdod and he destroyed them laid waste okay so an astonishment or desolated, right? Or appalled. Astonished. Okay, here's Jesenius, Hebrew, gra Hebrew grammar, page 355 or 356, talking about participles. The participle active indicates a person or thing conceived as being in the continual uninterrupted exercise of an activity. So it's a person in a in the continual ex exercise of a verb. So he's desolating or a desolator. He, that's what it means. He shall make it desolate. It's the desolator. Okay. And upon the border or edge of idols and false gods, abominations, shall be a desolator. And upon and until, ad, and until, kala. That's, kal means all. Kala is like the completing the consummation and and until the completion okay veneharatsa that's a nifal which is a passive haratz determined to sharpen to decide to be decisive in the nis in the nif in the nifel, to be decisive, and that decided, right, or determined, yiktol imperfect, okay, shall be poured, nat, natach, natach, to pour out, to be poured out, be melted, 
that's like got to do with like casting something out of metal. Um, it's it's to pour an idol, you would say, or to pour a cast, or it also could be like pouring a God poured rain out. So he poured. Okay, what is determined, or, or the determiner, right? Shall pour out upon the desolate. Now this word is interesting. This is the same word again, desolate, right? Desolation, shamam. But this here is a participle, active participle in the cow. And what that means is that active participle indicates a person or thing conceived as being in the continual uninterrupted exercise. So the desolator. Okay, let's read the whole thing now. And he shall be strong in a covenant with the many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to end. And upon the border or edge of idols and false gods shall be a desolator. And until the completion, what is decided shall be poured upon the desolator. So what is determined? I remember in the last verse, unto the end of the war, desolations are determined so it's saying okay this guy on the edge on the edge or on the cusp of idols will cause um, desolation and even until the end and desolations will be poured upon the desolator doesn't that sound like God that's that's what it that's what it says, and he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to an end, right? That's Jesus. He caused the sacrifice to come to an end, because the temple, the curtain in the temple was ripped in two. I think it's in the book in the Gospel of Matthew, and that signifies the end of the sacrifice in the temple. And it's been replaced by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. So that's the end of the sacrifice. Even though physically it went on for another uh, 20 or 30 years, spiritually it ended right there. And then it was brought to an end when the Romans destroyed it, right? The people of a prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, right? So, that was what happened. Now, okay, he shall confirm. So this is talking about the Messiah now. He shall be strong in the covenant with the many, which, which is the many nations, right? For one week, for seven years. So Jesus preached for three and a half years. And then, um, the... Uh, after his resurrection, for the other three and a, three and a half year, more years went on, and then Paul was made an apostle, and the gospel went to the Gentiles. So he, he confirmed the covenant for one week, and in the midst of the week he was cut off, and at the end of the week the gospel went to the Gentiles. But this is where what begins the overspreading of abominations, or the edge of abominations. So what's the edge of abominations? Okay, well, let's take a look here. Uh, you know, what, what has been brought into God's sanctuary? Let's do a quick Google search. Images. Here we go. What's all this? What's all this stuff? Is this uh, idols? 
idols in, in the gospel of Jesus Christ? It's, it's sort of on the edge, isn't it? It's not, it's not really the false gods. It's Christian, isn't it? Or is it not Christian? Like, what's this thing? What's this all about? Where, where in the Bible do you find this stuff? The Sacred Heart of Mary? What's that all about? Act of Consecration to Mary. Okay, where do you find this in the Bible? This is on the edge of abominations. Okay? Um, let's try another one. How about uh, pictures of Jesus? Oh, there's Jesus with his sacred heart too. Right? There it is. Okay? Look at all these. You, you can actually pray to these things. Is that really Jesus? What is it? What's this? You know? I mean, it's nice to have a, a maybe to make a picture that, of what you think Jesus is, looks like, but to make it an object of sacred reverence, that's a different thing, right? Even this. It's like, um, you would be better off going into your closet and praying to God than to sit before something like this, like a, like a statue like this, because this is an abomination in, in that context, right? So it's, it's on the edge, it's on the edge, the, it's on the, the cusp of an abomination. It's so close, it's hard to tell the difference, you know. Is it a Christian or is it pagan? What is it? So this is, a, this is causing desolation. It's causing um, um, a desolator. It's, it's causing um, shock. People are in shock. Like, how can this be done? This is this is shocking, and it, I imagine it's shocking to God too, right? So, we're going to talk in the next video more about this, but this is what I wanted to bring out in the study of these two verses of Daniel nine twenty particularly Daniel 9.27, because that's where it talks about, you know, they, they have the, the counter-reformation brought out some new interpretation that it's going to be some evil person in the future doing this. It's not. This is about Jesus Christ. This is a, a long-standing understood as talking about Jesus. He shows... Be strong in the covenant with many for one week, and he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to come to an end. That's Jesus in the middle of the week, right? Jesus. After three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people, so after the 69 weeks, that means... In the 70th week, right, the Messiah shall be cut off. In the 70th week, after the 69 weeks. But not for himself. It's for us. Okay? And the people of a prince that shall come, the Roman prince, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. Desolations, abominations of desolations. And in the midst of the week, in the middle of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. So in the midst of the week, that means, okay, in the seven-year period, from the time of Jesus' baptism until the gospel went to the Gentiles, that's seven years. And right in the middle, 
of those three and a half years, right in the middle of that week, is the crucifixion. So he shall confirm the covenant with the Gentiles, with the many, for one week, and in the middle of that week, he shall cause sacrifice and oblation to cease. And then, and for the, on the edge of abominations, he shall be a desolator. And until the completion, the decided desolations is what is decided, will be poured out upon the desolator. That's what that prophecy says. It's pretty hardcore stuff, but that's what it says. And it doesn't mean Jesus is bad. It means that Jesus... I came not to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. I came to bring division. That's what he said. So, that's the desolations. And also the idols. The idols, they, they start making idols of, of godly things. Or righteous people. Or... Anyone that stands up to be righteous in history, they make an idol of it. So that's um, um, an abominations, on the edge of abominations. So next week we're going to learn more about how this all comes to an end. And, and we're going to learn about the rapture. What is the rapture and how does that work? Well, I hope you enjoyed that video. Um, don't forget to send me a like, subscribe, share, and spread the word if you believe it. And uh, thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next week.